For those who are able to come physically to museums, I hope what they will see is themselves reflected back. Hello, and welcome to Design Adjacent, the podcast that explores the nexus of design both today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Vinny F. Johnson, and today our guest is Lisa Sasaki. Museums occupy an important space in our modern life. It's where we tell stories, it's where we document what's important to us, it's where we learn more about who we are as a people, as community, both today and tomorrow. And Lisa lives in this world of museums. I am pleased to invite her to the podcast today as she is the current interim director of the newest Smithsonian Museum, the recently approved Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. This new museum was established by Congress late in 2020 as a part of the broader Smithsonian. And Lisa was shortly appointed the interim director in March, 2021. She has left her post working with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in which she's been the steward and the leader. She was selected for her excellence in leadership and vision and bringing ideas to life to join this important effort. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, Lisa's had a career working in museums, both in audience, civic engagement, and education, taking her from the Oakland Museum to the Asia Pacific here in DC. She's been responsible for all of the elements of the museum's marketing, design, communication, and programs for both students and teachers. She's worked in program development at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And it's during her tenure there that she was in charge of the curatorial programs and public programs. She's been a curator of great renown, and she's been a collections manager, both in the West Coast and at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So it's a great pleasure to bring storyteller, museum professional, nonprofit leader and innovator, Lisa Suzaki to the podcast. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, Benny. Thanks for having me today. It's an incredible honor to have you. We were talking about how important the Smithsonian is as both a national treasure, as an educational resource, as a familiar experience, and as one of the most trusted brands in the world. And when we think of the Smithsonian, we often think of, of it in a things that have happened way. But I think it's important today for us to talk about all the innovation that's happening at the Smithsonian. And it's rare that a new museum launches and you get to be a part of leading that. So talk a little bit about how it feels to be the first interim director of the Women's History Museum. Well, it's incredibly exciting. I think it was such an honor when Secretary Lonnie Bunch asked me to serve in this position in order to be able to help get this new museum off the ground in its initial stages. It's something that is incredibly rare in any museum professional's you know, entire career to have the opportunity to create a, a brand new museum and to create a brand new museum for the Smithsonian is not even a double, but a quadruple honor um, in order for, for that to happen. So very exciting to, to be a part of this journey of being able to put this museum together. You know, I love to start. I'm, we're always curious in people's journeys and spaces and you have this, you know, career in which you've been a part of museums and it had to start somewhere. So Describe for me a bit, what was your first experience in a museum and when did you fall in love with them? So um, my first experience in a museum was back when I was in elementary school. I think many of us share that, right? The, the field trip to the local museum. And, and for me, it was in Denver. So I grew up in a suburb right outside of Denver. And so we would all troop on the, the bus down to downtown Denver to see the Denver Art Museum and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And so those were the museums that I grew up in. But I'll have to admit a little sheepishly that I actually really didn't love museums in the way that I do now. So I think part of that had to do with the fact that I didn't really think of it as a place that I could see myself in. I knew like when I was young, I wanted to be an archaeologist because I saw examples um, in popular culture about what it meant to be an archaeologist, but I never saw anything about people working in museums. So it, it was always a place to visit, but nothing that I thought I could do as a living. And I was lucky enough um, during the 
gap between my junior and senior year in college as an archaeology major, um, I went to field school and I discovered that I actually didn't like excavating. It was dirty. It was hot. <laughs> I didn't like um, doing that type of work, which was just um, crushing, to be honest, since I thought I wanted to be an archaeologist since I was in the fourth grade. But what was so amazing about that and what really did lead to my love of museums is my history um, advisor, when I went back and I was having a crisis saying, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. She's like, Lisa, was there anything about your field school experience that you really enjoyed? And I said, well, I liked working with the stuff that we were, you know, that came out of the dig. And she's like, oh, well, you should really think about museums and um, helped me get my first internship at the University Art Museum. And the rest is history. I've spent the last 25 plus years um, working in museums since then. So it's really amazing. And, and you've done everything in the museum from the object to what I first went familiar with you was engaging with the audience in the community and kind of having that bridge that, you know, in, in many communities, museums can have walls, you know, and these are the metaphorical walls that keep out those who, who are not a part of that. And a big part of the work you've done were designing experiences, both programmatic and educational, that brought people in to the museum. Talk a bit about, you know, your approach and, and what that means to do to bring people into the museum. At first, when I started my museum career, I was really thinking about museums as a place to hold objects. Um, I started off as a collections manager, really around taking care of objects. But what I quickly realized over time is that those objects just became things if they didn't have the attached stories that went along with those objects. Um, and not only were those things then with stories, Okay, but what really was important was when those things with stories connected with other people who were looking at those things and that they connect could connect it to the, the stories that they had. Then all of a sudden you had this really beautiful and powerful um, connection between people and objects. And I thought that museums could really serve as that bridge to be able to bring people together around their stories um, through the objects that the museums house. And that was a little bit different, I think, than um, when I first started in my career, because there were so many museums that were so focused on the objects or the curation of those objects, basically telling others what they should think about when you saw a, a piece of art or a collections object. And where that really changed for me is working at the Japanese American National Museum, where that museum was founded in order for a community to be able to tell its own stories, stories that often didn't appear in mainstream media or in textbooks or in, in other museums. And so I really realized how powerful it was when communities were allowed to present for themselves their own stories and the objects that represented them. You know, it's really interesting to, to talk about the role of stories and the objects. And when we think of museums, you know, those listening, they often think of the museums as the ultimate house of these objects. But one of the things I know that you've been responsible for in your career is moving even beyond that and creating kind of the un- museum experience. I think about your work at the Asia Pacific Center in which you don't have a building, right? So it's interesting. You don't physically have a building yet, but yet you're able to do pop-ups and happenings that bring the museum experience to life. Share a, a bit about that, that kind of approach. It was really kind of innovative to, to think about the museum without walls. I think that's what's so important is to realize that um, museum walls are often there to protect objects, right? We need to keep people at a distance. People are seeing objects through a plexiglass case or a, a, a glass front that keeps you separated from those, those things. And that's done for a very good reason. You know, oftentimes those those artifacts that art is very precious and it's, it can't be replicated. So we still want people to have that experience, but you can also realize that especially in today's world where we have things like podcasts and um, digital activities and opportunities to gather in, in spaces other than museums, that you could still bring people together um, beyond those walls, um, breaking those walls down 
in a way that you could still share stories and experiences and connect with one another that doesn't require an exhibition or a museum to do that, which is what we did at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. We would do things like pop up in a, a storefront in uh, New York City or in a mall in Honolulu and bring amazing artists to interact directly with the public so that they can learn about the work that they were doing, um, the thinking behind it. And I think more importantly, to understand how that work challenges our understanding of, in this particular case, what it means to be Asian American or even what it means to be American in a lot of ways. It was, I remember one of your curators having the talk and talking about curator as DJ and thinking about the space and the takeovers that you had. I think it was an, it was an old fish market that you'd taken over with performance and community experience. And that became the museum. Yes. And that's the thing to go back to is really, if we understand that museums are about stories, um, that storytelling, that interaction can happen anywhere. And it's, it's up to the museum then to be able to leave perhaps the safety sometimes is perceived, the safety of a building, to be able to go out into places where people spend 99% of their time is outside of museums. So it's really fascinating to be able to do these moments where you show up in unexpected places and engage people in unexpected ways. It really speaks to kind of that, that rich power of community that we see in the work. And I hope our, our audience understands and appreciates just the, the kind of innovative art that Lisa's had in working at these other museums, whether it's object or space or story, that gives her a great sense of tools coming into the latest role. So let's talk a bit more about that. You're building a brand new museum. There's not really a, a playbook, if you will, and a museum to tell stories that have been untold in dynamic ways. You know, and I know a lot of work went in to building this museum about women's history. Talk a bit about how this has become a passion project. Well, I think, you know, this has been a passion project for a generation of women before me. You know, the efforts to create this museum has been around for over two decades. Really, this recognition that women are highly underrepresented, um, not only on the National Mall, but across the country, uh, across the world, um, when you look at the gender gap on places like Wikipedia, in museums, just on TV, it's quite astounding Consider, you know, that women make up 50% of the population. So one of the things that I'm really excited about and why this has become such a passion for me is it gives us this opportunity to not only make those voices, those stories visible, but to do it in a way that hasn't been set in stone already. You know, so many museums have this long history, you know, 50 years, 175 years in the case of the Smithsonian. But we have this opportunity, this rare opportunity to actually think differently. And so the motto that I'm bringing into this particular museum is a really wonderful quote from Dr. Mae Jameson, who's the first African-American woman astronaut. She has very famously said not to allow someone else to limit you because of their own limited imagination. And so what I wanted to do is, you know, at this moment when we're building this new museum is to ensure that we don't let our own limited understanding of what museums could be limit us as we create this new entity in 2022 versus in 1990, uh, when many people sort of think of a little bit of the heydays of museums. It's interesting if you start to approach building and designing this from, from this vantage point with your imagination and having, having no limits. What are the things you're bringing to the table? So we have, we have stories. You mentioned that we have objects. What are the other tools that you're looking to, to build in this new, new museum? We have a new sense of inclusiveness um, with this, that this is not going to be a monolithic story. It's We're starting out this process with the recognition that women's experiences in America cannot be seen through a single lens, but we have to apply multiple lenses to it that not every woman has had the same experience and that's okay. In fact, that's what adds to the richness of what we can present in this museum. 
So um, part of the excitement um, and asset to this is that understanding from the, the beginning that this is not going to be a single story that we tell. It's not going to be only about the first and the best, although they will be there. We will do a celebration of those women who have succeeded and, and opened the path up for everyone who, who's followed. But we also have to recognize that it is also the amazing brilliance of the everyday woman that's also equally as important. So I think that is a really huge asset getting started is just even that mentality of, of sort of broad, a broad scope, a broad understanding of what our purpose is. So, you know, when you think about building something of this importance and this magnitude, we know you can't do it by yourself. What are your thoughts and viewpoints on collaboration? How do you encourage both within your team, but within this coalition that you're building? How do you encourage collaboration? Collaboration is something that is a cornerstone of all of the work I've done. I mean, if, if you're trying to go far, right, you do it together. If you're trying to go fast, you can sometimes go by yourself. I would argue that everything we do in today's world has to be a, around collaboration. And there are so many amazing organizations and professionals who have, like I've said, have dedicated their entire existence to this effort of ensuring that women have a, an equal voice um, in lots of different industries and lots of different fields. And it's our job in order to be able to collaborate with those people. I think how you encourage it is really making it fundamental to your organization from the, the beginning to understand that it's it's really not the option to go fast and alone, <laughs> um, but instead this is a journey we're all taking together. And I think that that's something that you know we really do understand as as we undertake this particular build at this particular time. So I have a question with your experience you've had in museums in various stages from start to restart to expand. What's the one thing that's been surprising as you look at launching this new museum? There's a couple things that just sort of pop to mind. One of which is, you know, sort of the sense of excitement. I expected there to be interest in this, but the amount of people, men and women um, of all ages, who have said, you know, this is something that's really important, surprised me. I think this is incredibly and surprising to hear so often people pointing out that this is not just a museum for women, but instead this is a museum for everyone. Because if we are going to address gender inequality, we need both sides to be willing to learn, to be willing to share. And so that's something that we very quickly changed in our sort of initial language was we were talking about, you know, grandmothers and daughters and granddaughters and wanting to switch that out so that it's more inclusive to say this is about grandparents and their hopes and dreams for their children and grandchildren. This is, a, is something that goes beyond gender. So that for me was was really surprising. I'll also say it's it's really surprising about all the work, <laughs> to be blunt, um, that goes into building something from scratch. I think I know I had sort of a very sort of glamorous, maybe idealistic view of, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if I got to start from scratch? I'll have to say that having gone through the experience of starting something completely from scratch, you know, there was no bylaws for the board. There was no board, um, advisory board. There's no staff other than me when I first was, was asked to fill this role. And so it's quite an experience to actually be there. I think the only people who might be able to understand this are those who've started their own business. It's very much the same thing. You know, you're, when you have to build everything, you know, without necessarily having like you said, that blueprint there. You know, to add to your space, if I can, it's also interesting that you're really in an entrepreneurial space. You're a part of the larger Smithsonian, which has the, you know, 175 year history, but it's not a history of innovation in this space like this. So you're doing new things that are kind of different than everything else that's happening in the Smithsonian from a structural standpoint, right? Right. No, and I agree. And I would say, like, to give kudos to, um, you know, the other museums that have gone before us, like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, they help set a roadmap, right? So at least they've gone through the journey before us. But I think what's important to point out is 
it's going to be a different journey, right? They started doing this 15 years before now. The world is very different. When you think about it, when that museum was taking off, we didn't have the type of technology and the interconnectiveness that we have today. There was no pandemic. There were no, you know, you take your pick on things that have happened over the last 15 years that will influence the building of this museum and the National Museum of the American Latino, which was also authorized by Congress at the same time. So while we're incredibly grateful for them, it is going to be a different journey. It's a different journey by time and innovation gap, right? And even with Namak, there were moments that they, there are things at Namak that are born digital, right? From the first generation that, that they were able to launch as innovative experience tools right when they launched five years ago. But we think about how far our interactive experience has gone in those five years. And yeah, you're going to be launching a museum that's going to open physically and digitally another five, 10, 15 years from now, right? Exactly. And we can do that in a way we can launch digitally in a way that Namak wasn't able to, you know, they really had to wait until the museum opened physically. Um, we can start to launch virtual experiences long before we open up our physical doors to the public. So that that is a, a big difference from what, you know, their experience was. I think we also have the opportunity to to take advantage of the time that we have between now and when the, the doors open to sort of keep up with what's happening out there. Advances in virtual reality, augmented reality that's happening, different types of hybrid giving models that are now out there. New ways of experimenting with people showing support through merchandising or different types of products that could go to support the museum. So these are all things that I think we're really open to as we start this journey together because we can write our own playbook. You can hear it, you know, the, the being open for the freshness of ideas and approaches that you get benefits of. So you've been a spectator to all those things happening when other museums had to go through the kind of pivots and halts and stops during the pandemic, you didn't have a space. So those decisions were not in your space. Now, what did you learn from watching your peers and how to design experiences or approach? What did you learn from those around you? 100% museums can do the pivot. I think before the pandemic, there was a question about whether or not museums could, like the Asian Pacific American Center, exist beyond their walls. But then we had two years where there were no other choices except for us to do that. And I saw amazing things like teacher workshops where before you might have been lucky to have gotten 25, 30 teachers into a room in DC, but because all of that got converted to online, suddenly we had teachers from across the world, not just across the United States, attending the programs um, and workshops. So that's something that I think I definitely learned is 100% we, what we do can translate into the digital space. The other thing that I learned, I think many museum directors and professionals learned as well, is that our normal is changing, right? It will probably never completely go back to the way it was before. We have to imagine that things like teleworking and, you know, Zoom meetings and the expectation for virtual access will probably never go away at this stage, but instead something that we're going to have to integrate and be able to offer going forward. So when you think about, you know, the museum's role in education, we often come back to the grade school versions of ourselves, like the experience that we have in those, those school trips. And you can hear the sounds of the bus and the bag of lunches and the experience of lining up with your partner and going was so much a part of our formative experience. What do you think our next generation of young learners will experience? I think one of the things that I hope, I really hope with this next generation is that they think about museum not just as a place to line up and get onto, to go to a field trip, you know, get on a bus to go on a field trip to, but instead something that we are in their classrooms and we are a resource for whatever they need, whether they need inspiration, they need an answer to a question a teacher is proposing, you know, or asking them. I think what I would really love to see is for 
students in particular to see us as part of their day-to-day life. And I think that's something that we were missing. We, we associate museums with those field trips. And I hope that that changes. For those who are able to come physically to museums, I hope what they will see is themselves reflected back. When I got on those buses to go to the Denver Art Museum or to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and nothing against those institutions, but I really didn't see myself there. I didn't see any other little Asian American girls there other than me and my, my immediate family. I didn't see curators who looked like me working there. I didn't see artists presented in the works that looked like me. So what I really do hope in the future that no matter what museums these learners go into, that they see themselves and that they're inspired about by what they see in order to do better than what we were able to do. And I think it, it speaks to something I know it's near and dear for you is access as well. Because we often, like you said, we think about the field trip and then that situates us in proximity, right? So if you live close enough to a major center or a major space, you have that experience. But I'm sure there are people who are going to be listening to our podcast who live in those in-between spaces where a field trip is not accessible because the bus doesn't go as far. It's cost prohibitive. I know for me growing up in D.C., I didn't know until I was an adult that museums had a cost because I grew up in the shadow of the Smithsonian. So everything was free and it was going to other cities in which you're standing in line and paying that you realize that that space, but just how much of a barrier that that can become. So when I think about the new museum, it's a national museum that has the opportunity to have access for those to attend all over the country and the world. How are you looking to fill in those in-between spaces? I think a lot of that, we have to look to technology to help us with that, to give people that access. And when you look at what the Smithsonian has done over the last several years, whether that's the open access process where, you know, allowing anybody to come in and use the digital resources that the Smithsonian has from its collections is a good example of that. I also feel that we, we need to be able to guide people through all of the information that's out there, when we think about what is on, you know, the internet right now, there is just a ton of stuff. Uh, Some of it is noise, some of it's good, but oftentimes it can be difficult even to find it. So with the Smithsonian's stellar reputation and brand, which, uh, you know, I'm incredibly honored to be a part of, I think that when people come to to a trusted source, it's often the Smithsonian. And we can use that to reach people who might not be able to visit us in D.C. In keeping with learning access, we often start with the younger version of ourselves. But the reality is we're committed to this larger distribution of knowledge, which is the heart of the Smithsonian's goal. So when you think about lifelong learning, what are some of the ways that you're thinking about exciting people about museums who may not consider themselves museum people? I think what's so important in that particular journey is really going back to this idea of what are people, what are people interested in? And more importantly, what do they need? You know, adults, adult learners have so many different constraints on their time and their ability to direct the what limited time that they have in their day to day life. And how is it that we can address what they're interested in, what they need? in order to be able to move forward. And I think that's where I think we should take a huge lesson from the design world, really, to all of the usability testing that designers do to be able to really put the user first when it comes to developing experiences for those adult learners and start there, right? It shouldn't be about what Lisa Sasaki thinks as um, who's already indoctrinated in loving museums and loving what's in museums to try to craft an experience. Instead, we should be talking to the people who don't necessarily see themselves in museums and find out from them what they need and what they want to see and then create that arrangement. So when you think about what do you want to see in designing, if you were to look forward, what is success in launching a museum? What's success for you? 
Success is being able to open to the public, both a physical and a virtual space that they feel welcomed in and that they see themselves in. That for me is success. I think we can achieve success in lots of different ways as a result of that, but I think we will be 100% missing the mark if in either of those spaces that people don't feel that they are welcomed, that their stories, that their insights are equally as welcome, which is going to be a challenge for us as museums. I think oftentimes it tends to be a little bit of a one-way street, right? We're always expecting people to come to us. It's like that person who always invites you to dinner, but never accepts a dinner invitation back. (laughs) Uh, We want to be sure that in the future, People not only feel comfortable in coming to Washington, D.C. or onto our website or our digital spaces, but that they also see us in their spaces as well showing up. And when we think about being a part of this effort, you know, I knew how special it was to be reached out to by the African American Museum as a part of the process. And so I wonder, for those who are listening, how can they help? And what ways can they be supportive of you and the mission and the growth of the museum What can they do to be a part of this community that brings us together? Well, right now, one of the things that we're really looking forward to is really having those early advocates and ambassadors who can just sort of talk about their hopes and dreams for for this particular museum, because we are listening. We're going through a process of getting feedback on everything from our virtual presence to, you know, the site that the museum will take place on we built on. So those are things that we're definitely hoping for. So people listening may hear about opportunities to answer a survey or participate uh, in a feedback session, and we hope that they, they will join us for that. I think one of the other things that's a part of this is we're going to be having to fundraise quite a bit of money in order to be able to build this. It's not cheap to build a a building on or near the National Mall. And so you'll be also be seeing in the future opportunities to donate to the museum and to support the building of the museum. And then finally, they can go and look at our progress and learn about everything that the Smithsonian is doing related to women's history on womenshistory.si.edu. And there's a website there that you can explore different parts of the Smithsonian collection. There's a donate button if you're so inclined to donate something to us at this point. And you can learn more about uh, the museum as it gets built there as well. This is incredibly important and helpful. One of the things you mentioned earlier, and I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the effort, you mentioned the absolutely dearth of information on public platforms like Wiki. And one of the things that we're really excited about in our AIGA community, we launched last year our Wiki Scholars Program because we saw the similar depth that design as a profession, only 18% of those bios on Wikipedia contain bios about women's contribution to design. So we're doing an effort in which we're training cohorts of individual volunteer citizen knowledge creators to bridge that gap and to fill in those histories for design of women, of people of color, of any spaces that have been left out to bring more equity to the knowledge base. So we're hoping that we can contribute and help you out in your effort as well as we as we do this work. Great. That's amazing. And so important because you can imagine for every industry, there's the same issue, right? This invisibility of women in the work. And so thank you so much for helping us get, uh, you know, those bios that those profiles into Wikipedia, because when you think about it, that is the most used space now on the internet where so many people are going just as an entry point into topics. And if they don't see women there, again, we're invisible. It's so true. And, and we've been digging in and it's been, you know, in the early phases and just being able to train and equip so that we know the right ways to build the knowledge so that it's accepted and it grows upon the space. If I ask this question for you to look back, so not not to the grade school, Lisa, but we're going to look back to the Lisa after the field trip. Did you ever imagine that this would be your professional life today? No, not uh, not in a million years. I think that's something I marvel about, not just with myself, but also with my family, that I don't think anybody could have imagined, myself included, that one day I would be 
uh, working for the Smithsonian and doing what I'm doing. So I feel incredibly lucky to have this opportunity and also want to encourage others out there to see careers for themselves in museums, that there's a lot of opportunities in a really exciting field that is very creative, that is very innovative in a lot of its aspects. And that there's a lot of room for the type of thinking that designers can bring into a museum space, not just as graphic designers or as exhibition de designers, which is what you typically think about when you think about design positions within museums, but all of the other skills that designers bring to the table, whether that's project management skills, whether it's thinking up abilities to think outside the box or to present things visually. Those are all things that any team um, and any museum across the country needs. On that note, I think it's an incredible pitch for the role that designers can have in museums and the role that if you're a student or growing or changing your career, to think about museums as spaces that are for creativity and impact. So when I think of objects and space and stories and the power of museum, Lisa, I think of you and the work that you're doing. And so I thank you for joining us today for this episode of Design Adjacent. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for listening. So once again, we encourage you to explore the work of the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum, one of the newest museums of the Smithsonian, as they go down the noble path of building a new museum on women's history. And we also encourage you to continue to follow us and check into our podcast, Design Adjacent, when we look at the role of design at the nexus of today and tomorrow. Show notes for this episode will be available on AIGA.org. Please subscribe to our show on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. AIGA's Design Adjacent podcasts and its contents are the copyright of AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. All rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the contents in any form is prohibited without AIGA's express written permission. My name is Li Shan Huang. Until next time.